process. There we go. Cool. Awesome. Uh, okay, so yesterday at the keynote, Yehuda didn't know it turned down for what was. I still don't know, so I'm going to take a poll and ask the audience. Uh, what is turn down for what mean that you turn it up? Does it mean you turn it down? No? Okay, mostly seems up. Okay. <laughs> Uh, so, my name is Matthew Beal. I'm part of a, a great team at 2 Created. We do a bunch of Ember consulting. Uh, I'm on the Ember core team. I blog at madheaded.com, and I'm on Twitter. Uh, I think everyone knows there's a talk in the other room about the Gipper, and I don't know what, what the Gipper. Um, uh, no, it was the, 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 the Rimmer. Does anyone watch Red Dwarf? No Red Dwarf, okay. Uh, or Schwimmer, but it's definitely one of them. And I don't know what this is. But before we get going, I wanted to get everyone's blood moving, because I know it's 3 o'clock in the afternoon. So everyone's like, second day of the conference, 3 o'clock. I'm at their peak of excitement. Good. Uh, so yesterday, we launched the Ember Community Survey during the EmberConf keynote. But I wanted to make everyone sure that everyone knows that the results are up and live. So I'm going to put up the URL. And when we put it up, I want everyone to cheer and I want them to wonder what's happening on the other side of the wall. <laughs> okay? Okay. So we had over, like, almost 2,000 people answer the survey. So it was, like, a huge success this year. It was, like, more people than they're at the conference. We're really excited about it. Are we ready? Ready? Okay. Woo! There's the URL! <laughs> You are the best. <laughs> Great. <sighs> okay. Uh, so in 1997, there was this book about architecture that came out. It kind of inspired a lot of the, the use of the word pattern that we have in programming. Uh, it describes about 250 different problems in architecture and like solutions that are general scenario solving solutions. They're not specific things like use a nail, uh, there are very high level things, like I want a roof that makes me feel like I'm comfortable, or I want doors that uh, have welcoming spaces once I go inside. Uh, it was also kind of the first hypertext book, because all the patterns were linked, so you would jump from pattern to pattern, pattern 21, and you'd go back and forth. Um, a big part of it was trying to think about design from a user-centric point of view. So the people who live in these buildings, the people who use these patterns, are the people who understand best what's actually happening, not the people designing things on the outside. And I think when you look at web components, this is uh, pretty directly applicable. We have a, a five-year process trying to come up with a design solution for web components, and uh, I don't think we can say that we have it yet, and it might be another few years. Uh, the attempt was to design in a pattern language was to come up with designs that were based on experience, so watch people in spaces and see how they act and try and take lessons away from that. Uh, and importantly, none of the patterns were really implementation steps. They weren't telling you, in order to do this pattern, this is exactly what you do. They said, your roof should be something that goes all the way down to a human height because humans don't like to walk up to straight vertical things. But it doesn't tell you exactly how to solve that problem. Uh, and a lot of times in programming, we talk about a pattern, we say, this is, oh, you just use that pattern as if that was to answer how you actually get your job done, and in reality, there's a lot more that you have to do. It's just the start of the discussion. Uh, so if we're going to talk about interoperability and how to use these things across a number of different consuming environments, uh, let's figure out what we're talking about a little bit. Uh, I'm going to walk through three different scenarios, ways that you could possibly use these, and we're going to um, not, do, not talk about one of them. One of them we're going to reject, but we're going to keep these other two. Uh, so in this case, we have a Rails server, and I presume everyone in this room has done some kind of server-side generated um, uh, HTML. But we build an HTML string, goes down to the browser, browser boots up that string, turns it into DOM, boots our component. And that's totally cool. We're going to talk about that case. We're going to make components that work in that environment. Uh, our second one is that we have, say, a React template. And React templates, like Ember templates, like Angular templates, at the end of the day, they're manipulating DOM. And so they're going to create some DOM, and then that DOM is going to boot up a component 
the internal implementation of the component could be different. So uh, in Ember, if you render an Ember component from another component, you know, it's Ember talking to Ember. In this case, we could have anything. There's a layer of abstraction, so it could be Ember on the outside, Vue on the inside, React on the outside, Angular on the inside. We're trying to create a boundary that's flexible enough to be used in both directions. And that's totally cool. You can do that. Uh, the third case here is uh, that we have uh, something that's rendered on the server side. So Riot being rendered on the server side and generating DOM that's used for the first flash is a good example of this. And you can say that on the server, if you had a component in Riot, you might want to render the internal DOM that that component has so that's visible on, on first boot. Uh, we're not going to talk about that case. Another example would be Fastboot. If Fastboot uses one of these components, you know, does the DOM that's part of it actually show up? Well, no, we're just going to boot it on the client side. So that one we're going to reject. <laughs> so we want a component that's usable from any client side consumer, any client side environment. That's generally, that's generally the, the thing that we're looking for. Uh, in the pattern language, there's like a, a variety of ways to implement these things. And so uh, you're supposed to look at the environment to figure out what the pattern is. And if you look at all three of these, you can see the, the slope of the roof and where it comes down. You can see how they use windows and things like that. So we're going to look at a variety of environments and, and uses as well. And these are basically going to be our list. Of course, there's a bunch of other libraries and frameworks out there that you could or could not use. And I wish we could cover them all, but um, there is literally not enough room on that projector. So uh, the first pattern to doing a successful component that you can use across a variety of frameworks is to use custom elements via a polyfill. Uh, custom elements are a what WG W3C spec. Uh, they are still draft, so it's not done. This is one of those ones that's been around for years. Um, uh, they allow us to invoke JavaScript-defined behavior via DOM or HTML. So in these two examples, we have DOM that's going to create an element. This could boot up our custom JavaScript behavior. HTML is a declarative language that describes how to build DOM. So in HTML, if we do a my component, then we know that that's basically going to translate into some DOM, into some DOM creation stuff. So it'll work the same way. So in this case, custom elements works really well. And this would be like our case of sending HTML down from the server. So that's totally fine. Uh, if we're going to work in a client-side environment, because custom elements are built into the DOM at a very low level, it just works. Everyone else just generates DOM, so this is totally a safe thing. So custom elements are a great solution for this. So the, the twist in the pattern is that we want to make sure we use them via a polyfill. We don't want to use the API directly, and partially it's just because it's a spec. Uh, so it's obviously, this is basically what it looks like if you were to use it and look up usage today. This is what a lot of websites tell you to do. Um, but it's not really supported. Uh, there is a, basically a lot of the web component stuff was a very big push by Google to uh, make it happen a, a long time back. And a lot of people are just getting on board now. So they haven't felt the pressure yet. So you need to use a polyfill to be around if you want to work in browsers not named Chrome or Android or Opera. Uh, the other reason you want to use a polyfill is that 18 days ago, the spec changed. And now it's not register element anymore. It's custom elements not defined. Uh, so this is still very, very much churning, and I would hope that if you use a well-constructed polyfill, maybe you can isolate yourself from some of the pain of all these changes that are coming down the pipeline. Uh, if you had to choose one, there is a custom elements polyfill that's from the Google people that's used inside of Polymer. That's a good standalone option. Uh, Xtag is from Microsoft and tries to handle a couple of the other like pattern cases that we're going to go through. And uh, I suggest using that. And then Polymer is actually a pretty good option as well, although it's a little bit bigger. Polymer, in general, seems like they more try to prototype what the future of web components could be, less than be an immediately, uh, like something that immediately solves your problems right now today. I think Xtag is maybe a better bet for fixing problems today. Uh, so it's simple. It works. You use a polyfill and easy. Uh, the second pattern that we're going to look at is to make sure that you pass attributes and then deserialize them into properties. Uh, and this one is going to need to do a little bit of unpacking, and we're going to do a little bit of diving into the spec to see why this is true. So the first part is really just to pass attributes. So why attributes and why not something else if we're going to get data down and into these things? And whenever we're talking about uh, using these components or writing these components, we're really talking about two different roles in the relationship. So we have author concerns, and we're going to have consumer concerns. 
And uh, when we're designing these patterns and trying to come up with uh, a, a solution that fits all these different constraints, we really need to go back and forth. Uh, so we're going to talk about some author constraints. We're going to go and look at some consumer concerns, and we're going to come back to the author ones, and that's going to give us the, the whole story here. So we talked about HTML being uh, declarative before, and one of the facets of, H of something that's declarative is usually that it has a lot of restraint. Um, you want to isolate yourself from any of the implementation details of what's happening under you. Uh, and so in HTML, uh, you're really just generating DOM that does basically this. Uh, it generates DOM, it calls set attribute as, as an API. Uh, nothing else is really happening from the HTML to the DOM parsing step, but when we go and we interact with these elements, we obviously see that we can get an attribute, and that's to be expected because we set an attribute, but we also get D as an ID of wrapper. Now, this is one of those things that everyone, I'm sure, in this room takes for granted that this happens, but isn't it a little bit odd that when you do something for wrapper ID, when you have a different attribute, well, it's kind of not gonna show up. And if you do something like hidden, you can set it to a blank string, and it comes back as true. Like, the, what, what, are, what, are the, what is like the reason that, that defines what's going on here? Uh, why, when I do a, a well-known thing like ID, do I get an attribute and a property? Why sometimes do I get attributes and no properties? And why do I get an attribute and a Boolean property? So for an example, let's kind of take a dive and go look at hidden and why hidden works like it does. And so we're gonna go open, use our magic words and open the HTML spec and hope it doesn't bite us. Uh, so the hidden attribute is a, if you can read, if that font's not too small, the Boolean, a Boolean attribute. Uh, a Boolean attribute, so we can jump over to that part of the spec and figure out what a Boolean attribute means when it's hidden. Uh, the presence of a Boolean attribute represents the value, the absence of the attribute represents a false value. So that gives us a reason why we had a thing that had true and false. But we still have no idea why it's actually showing up as a property, right? We just know that something internally means that it's, it's true or it's false. Uh, so at the bottom of the hidden section, there's a, a line that says the hidden ideal attribute must reflect the content attribute of the same name. And if you go through the spec and you search for that sentence, something like it, you find it over and over and over again. Um, so to unpack that, what's going on there, the hidden ideal attribute must reflect the IDL attribute, so IDL is this language that defines what actually what the DOM node actually looks like. So the IDL attribute is really a property that's on the DOM node. So if we go to div, which is what was hidden, we can see its implementation is based on HTML element. Uh, IDL is a language to define interfaces that has a, like inheritance of its own. It has some implement stuff down at the bottom um, for giving you traits. Uh, but we can see further down here, we can see that we've actually got the Boolean attribute of hidden. And this is what tells us that we have a property called hidden. So the reflecting. So we know that we have a thing on the DOM called hidden. We know that we have an attribute that has some semblance of true and false. So how do we know when to go back and forth and, and how to do that? And that's what uh, reflection actually is, which is gobs of text to tell you that when you set an attribute, sometimes it should go and be turned into a property with certain rules, and sometimes it should be turned back in the other direction as well. Um, so this is really wacky because this exists for every single attribute and every single DOM node that you use in HTML. And there's a long list that tells us what to do for every single one. If you use size on an input, if you use size on a span, why are they different? The, the IDL will tell you exactly what's going on. So we always know how these things map back and forth. Uh, but at least we have rules that we can look up. So we can know exactly what happens for any one of these cases just by reading the spec. And if we wanted to implement this stuff on our own and make these things which behave kind of like we want custom elements to behave, uh, we can actually like, you know, figure out how to do that. Uh, what's a little bit trickier is when we actually have my component. So my component has a count of three, which is a string, and now, like, what happens to it? Does it show up as a property? Does it not show up as a property? Um, so if, uh, so, so there's like two reasons why you would want to always use the attribute. The first is that my component could come down as part of the HTML for the page, and uh, because the IDL defines reflection only for specific cases, there's really no, there's no way at all for in HTML for you to set a property on a thing. You can only set an attribute and then allow it to reflect with very specific rules. So for web components, those rules don't exist, so we have no way to set properties, so we can't use, uh, we can't use properties. 
Uh, there's no browser spec that tells us what that actually, what that actually does. Uh, actually, because we are extending uh, HTML elements in this example as well, though, we do get some reflection. We get like hidden. Hidden is actually reflected. So the rules are even kind of like tricky and inconsistent at this point. Uh, so that's the authoring side of the component, trying to figure out how you can actually get some data from the outside world. So if we look at the uh, consumer, the consumer concerns, how we're going to call these things, uh, we need to know that we can actually call them in a variety of environments. So this is passing a static attribute in a variety of contexts. Obviously, DOM and HTML are really simple. Uh, everyone else is basically the same. So this is, again, a very optimistic scenario. We have a, a good, it seems like attributes are a good way for us to pass data in. When we go to bind them, it gets a little bit stranger. Obviously, there's no way for us to bind a value in DOM or in HTML. But in all these other frameworks, uh, it differs. It begins to diverge. But there is actually a way to do this uh, across the board. So this is the second argument for uh, really using attributes over properties, is that there is no great way in Ember. Uh, interesting is that all of these are solving the problem in a different way. Ember looks at the element that it created, and it says, does it already have a property of count? If it already has a property on the DOM node, then I'm going to use the property. If I don't, then I'm going to set an attribute. Uh, React has a special rule that says any tag that has a dash in the name is a web component, and so just always use attributes. Uh, Angular 1x, I'm not quite sure what the rule is, <laughs> but Angular 2 uh, decided to make it explicit. Instead of having this guessing game that goes on with these other ones, instead you have to opt in and say exactly what you want. So uh, the bracket in Angular 2 defines binding. I want to bind to a, a, a property with this name, but sometimes you don't want a property, so to not get a property, you prefix it with adder dot, and then you will always set an adder that is read from the value, which is the string on the right. Um, they have a really, they went like a very explicit direction, which is going to help them later on, although it uh, can be a little bit tr self trolling in terms of the actual syntax and how it reads. Uh, so the last concern with using attributes is that they're always strings. So we don't have any way to pass numbers in, we don't have any way to pass functions in, we don't have any way to pass arrays in or anything like that. And that's kind of the other part of this is deserialization. There's the, a number of the, the libraries that do web component stuff pretty well today. Uh, already handle this for you. Uh, Polymer has a really simple setup where you just say a property which defines a mapping of an attribute over to a property. <laughs> and that's the, you can give it a type and it'll just process it through that and you can register custom types. Uh, a little bit smaller because it's much more verbose. Xtag doesn't have one for um, numbers. I don't know quite why. But you could write one on your own. They have a getter setter system uh, which installs uh, ES5 getters and setters on the DOM node, and then you can use those to look up things that are on the attribute, which is also a pretty uh, nice, really flexible, uh, flexible system. So attributes are a pretty successful, successful way to do this. Uh, the third pattern is to always communicate with, uh, with events. Uh, and mostly, we're going to look at it from the perspective of a, com of a consumer concern. In JavaScript libraries that have a, a, a top-down pattern, so React came along and kind of, a, well, yeah, I guess to really step back, Ember, Ember 1 had a lot of action bubbling. And I guess we still have that in some places in Ember 2, unfortunately. Uh, but action bubbling basically tried to create an alternative system to the way that the DOM already emitted events and passed information around and let you say from a deeply nested view, say, or controller, I want to go ahead and bubble this action up through various Ember parts of the ecosystem. Uh, React uh, brought in this style where you can instead say, I want to pass down an explicit function. And when you can define a function like that, you can close over local variables, you can bind it to your local scope and pass it down. You can do all kinds of things that allow you to pass something all the way down the stack, have it be called, and then have it make a change elsewhere in the application. And Ember's embrace this by having closure actions where we do a similar thing. At the time that you define the closure action, we go ahead and create a function, and then we just pass that function back down through the system. So this is something that we would like to be able to do with web components, but there's definitely at least one major issue. Uh, you can imagine that you could take this string and then a valid and come up with a function, and that, that would work pretty well, but you lose all sense of scope and context. So if you actually care about what is, the, what is your current this, um, what is in your current environment that you're in, you don't have access to any of that information. So instead, you have to only access things in a global context, which wouldn't be very useful. 
So we need kind of an alternative way to pass information around. Uh, some HTML elements, as kind of a gotcha, do kind of do this, right? You can have an onclick and you can pass it a string which acts kind of like what we want. Uh, the problem is that all this stuff down at the bottom here is what is defined in the HTML spec. So none of that is available to us because we don't have any of those mappings. We don't have any IDL or any definition of our own behavior. All we have is the ability to pass a raw attribute and then to, to deal with that raw attribute. So that's not a great situation. Uh, when we look at using an attribute, we can't do that because we're gonna lose all of our context and that's gonna stink. Uh, we don't have a great way to pass properties onto things because we can, there, there's no way to do that in most of the frameworks. They don't have a way to, to say, I want to pass a property instead of passing an attribute. Uh, and in HTML, unfortunately, there's no way to add an event listener without having the, the, the IDL stuff, the spec stuff like this, we have no way to say on click is gonna add an event listener like happens here. Instead, we have to, we always have to register and do this stuff on our own. So that kind of sucks. So we need uh, some way to pass the information. Uh, and most of our easy avenues are cut off, which is why we're going to look at events. And this is a compromise. You could find ways to work around this one, but I think when you uh, balance the, the upsides and downsides, events are, are definitely the best, uh, the best way to go. Uh, there are really three reasons why I think it's the, uh, the best suggestion. So HTML elements already communicate like this, and Custom elements at the end of the day become DOM nodes just like anything else. So they're living in that same world in that same tree. So I really think that they should behave as, as similar as possible. When you have a div, if you click on that div, the browser is gonna, you know, the, the spec of the browser is gonna tell it to go ahead and, and create an event and go ahead and dispatch it and, dispatch it and do a bunch of things. Uh, we can do that same stuff. There is, there is an imperative API that we can call and we can create events and we can dispatch them and make them look exactly as if they were normal click events. So if on my component I wanted to fire a click when you hold your finger down on your mobile device, we could totally customize that behavior and fire off click events that the rest of the environment thinks are real click events. The second reason is that events have a somewhat common interface. Uh, if you have an event listener for click, you get all this information that kind of comes for free if you use the dispatch system. Um, some of it's relevant to the fact that you're, it is relevant to the fact that you're on the DOM. So for example, your target, um, when you're bubbling, your current target will, uh, will separate and you'll, the current target is whatever you're actually attached to. Uh, but you get information that comes with these in a rather predictable spot. So it doesn't matter if Angular is firing this or if Ember is firing this or if you're using Xtag or Polymer, you always know that these pieces of information are gonna be attached. Uh, if we had a callback function, we would, we would never know that. Of course, there are definitely times when you want to pass custom information, but there is actually a common path for that as well. Uh, and this is, there's some other APIs that you might have seen if you had been looking at custom events elsewhere and you guys have been playing with the stuff on your own. Uh, you can call new custom event or new event, um, but it's not supported in IE. Uh, this is supported in all browsers, even though, uh, similar to what Yehuda was saying yesterday, uh, the MDN website tells you it's deprecated and don't use it. But it is the only thing that works across all the browsers. <laughs> Uh, so if you want to make mouse wobble, you can make a custom mouse wobble event. Uh, the last object that gets passed as an argument up there where it says direction vertical, that is the details, and it will always be available as e.detail, so you can access it from anything. You can always know where to look for your custom stuff that's getting bubbled up. And the third reason is just that uh, events are a very mature API on the web. Uh, they have solved a lot of problems and are compatible with a lot of solutions, that uh, if you have to do custom callbacks, you won't necessarily have a way to do. So they have capture phases where you can uh, say, I want to handle this before anything else handles it. You can have them bubble up through the stack. You can configure the bubbling up through the stack and say, I want this to be, uh, I want someone to, I want to allow them to cancel it or I don't want to allow them to cancel it from bubbling up the stack. Uh, and there are really good patterns like delegation where you can have something higher up on the DOM kind of managing all the events for its children that you couldn't do if you wanted to do pure function passing. So on the web and on the DOM, events I think are a really robust way to do this and we should just be embracing them and using them more. Uh, there are consumer concerns for this and unfortunately the only one who has a great API for dealing with it uh, is Angular 2. Uh, Angular 2 introduced a parentheses syntax. Uh, it is slightly self-trolling again, but it is very exact. Uh, 
Parentheses means I want to add an event listener with this name. There's also, in case your HTML preprocessor can't handle non-alphanumeric property names, uh, you can use on dash. So then there's an alternative that degrades. And then dollar sign event is like a magic global that represents whatever the current event object is. So you can pass it into things. Uh, for everyone else, you're pretty much just going to need to add event listeners and do it on your own. Um, we can, of course, improve this, and we'll run through a quick way to improve it in Ember in the future, but uh, that's something that we're just going to be stuck with for a little bit. I still think it's the best path forward. Uh, I think if you follow all these, you, uh, regardless of like, the exact tools that you use, if you use Polymer, if you use Xtag, if you use a, a pure polyfill on your own or something like that, you'll be able to put together something that could be invoked from any of these different environments that exist from inside an Angular app, an Ember app, or coming from the server side, and it should work well. Uh, the custom elements spec is supported pretty well in some form or another. The polyfill at least works all the way back to IE9. Uh, so you could actually use these in real applications and use like the X tag polyfill and uh, ship real things that work for all of your real users. It's not actually things of the, uh, it's not the future, it is the now. Uh, so a couple practical recommendations. Uh, use Xtag or Polymer. I kind of suggest uh, working with Xtag if you want to choose one first to look at. Xtag is a little bit more diverged from the spec itself, but uh, Polymer, the border in between where it is polyfilling and where it is prototyping is blurred. Uh, and I think you can easily get yourself down a rabbit hole where you're, you're doing something in their shady DOM API or something like that, and it doesn't quite match what the real spec is gonna be. And if you wanted to have write code that you're gonna be using for the next two years, I don't think it's a very good option. It's great to experiment with, though. Um, but definitely use uh, one of them. If you're going to publish something, make sure you document how to use it in several environments because people still find this really intimidating and scary. Like I said, it works back in IE9 and we just listed how to call these things in all these different browsers. So um, it's, a very, it's actually a very safe thing to do, but we need to build confidence. I think you should not try and uh, work with some of the uh, more advanced uh, uh, early stage specs, such as Shadow DOM, which is still very, very much churning. A lot of these things, you'll see blog posts that are from 2013 saying, the future of web components is now, look, I have Shadow DOM in a scoped root CSS selector. Um, but none of that stuff works today. <laughs> uh, and if you want, again, if you want to build something that's going to be around for two years, I don't think it's a good option. If you want to experiment with it, you should definitely experiment with it and look at the conversations happening uh, with, the, with the standards boards and such. Uh, and Work hard not to expose the implementation details. I think that for most cases, passing attributes is going to be totally fine. There are definitely cases when you will want a performance workaround and you want to reach right in and set a property. Um, but I think you want to minimize those cases. And if you can avoid saying reach inside and do something awkward like pass a function straight to my property because I have some callback that for some reason wouldn't perform with events, I don't know why that would be. Um, but try to keep those things to a minimum if you really want to have it be easy for people to adopt uh, across the board. So Ember didn't have a great way to deal with events, uh, which kind of stunk, and our method for calling, uh, our like lazy decision about props versus adders, uh, where when you call my components and you say count equals three, we decide whether or not we're gonna send attribute based on if there is already a property. If there is a property on the object, we set that. If there's not, then we set an attribute. Um, that's kind of neat, but it's easy to troll ourselves. What if someone updated the component and they added a property called count because it's their object and they can add whatever uh, things they want to it. Now our consumer is broken and there's not a lot that we can do about it in Ember. There's really no workaround. There's no way to force the attribute. Um, so uh, we have a, an a element modifier RFC that's been floating around that still needs a bunch of work but it would allow us to bring back something that used to exist in helpers uh, in an earlier version of Ember. Uh, it was a very low level API that exposed too many things, but it did allow you to have uh, curly helpers that were called on any arbitrary element. And it'd be nice to bring back a version of element modifiers. Uh, the big challenge is really making them compatible with Glimmer components. What if my component here is a Glimmer component, or what if it's a web component, or what if it's a native DOM element? We want to ideally have one solution that works in a consistent way uh, across all three of those environments, which is really tricky. That would allow us to do things like force attributes. It would allow us to do things like force properties. Uh, it would allow us to do things like create um, little DSLs with style where we could go ahead and configure and bind things to our style and not have warnings about them being unsafe. 
uh, it'd allow us to do things like add event listener, so that we could have really like first class ways of uh, adding these without needing to wrap all of our custom elements inside of components in Ember. Uh, so those are neat things that we'd like to see. Uh, the other side of this is really from the producing standpoint. So what if you have an Ember uh, component, but you want to be able to use it for custom elements? How do we how do we get to how do we get to make that happen? Uh, these are all very unstable APIs, but kind of in the, the vein of the keynote yesterday, we were talking about using these new things to try and push the conversation forward. And I think that there's lots of ways that we can do that without needing to expound uh, too much effort. So I built a prototype that allows us to publish Ember components as uh, custom element web components. And let's see what it looks like. No, oh, whoops, that's not the right button. Cool. Uh, so here's an application that has a oops, not that one. Uh, that has an EmberConf hello component. Uh, we're following the pattern here of reflecting our attributes. So we're going to say that we have some properties called names and messages. They are types of arrays and strings. And this is going to do that same thing. Take something that comes in as an attribute and turn it, uh, deserialize it, and turn it into a property that I have access to. Uh, once you have deserialized them, uh, then they're going to be available. Whoops, making a mess of everything. Uh, they're going to be available in your template as WC adders. So they just add it as an object, as a POJO. We don't install them directly onto the component as properties, but we could. This is a prototype for sure. Uh, so we get a bunch of names and we decide what to do. There's some fancy white space control there with tildes, but this is just a normal um, Ember template. And if I want to invoke this, I can just do it in the HTML. I don't need to do this as part of the Ember app. So where did I put this guy? Oh, here he is. Is that the dummy app? Yes. Yeah. So here's our EmberConf hello. We're going to take Dan and Godfrey, and we're going to say welcome to EmberConf. Let's pull them up here. Oops. Cool. So here's our page. And if we view this guy as... Source. We can see that we're just getting our Ember Conf hello with Dan and Godfrey that comes down, and we boot it up, and it renders our Ember template right onto the page, which is pretty sweet. And to show there's nothing going on that's up our sleeves, we can have an Ember body inner HTML, and we can do that, and it does the same thing. So we don't even need to use any Ember, Ember APIs to like create or render anything. We just use custom elements, and they just show up in the right spots. And as long as we follow these basic patterns, you should be able to call this from anything. I could boot it up in a React app and I could render this Ember component um, properly. <laughs> awesome. So thank you very much for your time. I'm really happy to talk to you guys about this. <laughs>